Tales of the Night Lords Bring the Night by Rob Sanders They called it the Veiled Region for a reason. Dust choked and buried in the Garon Nebula, the Hell Stars were a bloodshot haze. Their dungeon glow the red of instruments heated for torture. What Demrid Sheremetev wouldn't give to see them now. Arx Phineas IV was a miserable garrison world in a forgotten corner of the Segmentum Tempestus. It was a bleak world. Mostly mica desert and crumbling fortifications that would hold more interest for an Imperial archaeographer than an enemy. To the 1002nd Volsian Shadow Brigade, it was home. As Lord Marshal and Planetary Governor, Sheremetev was responsible not only for his guardsmen, but also for the garrison-serving communities dotted across the small world. When a supply brig passed through a nearby meteor storm, the ship warned the garrison world that it too was likely to encounter the phenomenon. With little to do but drink, gamble and fight with the locals and each other, Sheremetev was eager to distract his men from the tedium of never-ending garrison duty. Seeking the sanction of his regimental commissar, the venerable Arturus Gannibal, the Lord Marshal proposed a skeleton watch and authorised a session of rest and recreation for the duration of the storm. In doing so, Demrid Sheremetev granted his long-suffering Volsians and the people of this ugly little world something that they could never have dreamed of finding in the murky skies. A night of beauty. As Arx Phineas IV's brief day turned to night, the Lord Marshal ordered an extra ration of grog for his off-duty guardsmen. Music from settlement drinking holes was carried across the mica deserts on the wilderness breeze. Volsians came out onto the sands, crowding around guard bastions and derelict fortifications. They sang the raucous songs of their hive world home with drink in their bellies and local girls in their arms. On the roof of the central command spire, among the vox masts and gun emplacements, the Lord Marshal and Arturus Gannibal shared a bottle of Amasek Sheremetev had been saving and watched the show. Eyes turned towards the heavens. The meteorite shower lit up the sky with its dazzling re-entries. The nebulous murk became a dance of light, flashing, streaming. Meteorites slashed down through the atmosphere, trailing blinding arcs of light. It was an incredible sight. The firmament glowed. It was the last beautiful thing any of them ever saw. Somewhere, a vox was bleeding static. It was all Sheremetev had heard for days. The brain aching hiss of nothingness, punctuated by begging, suffering and screaming, or sometimes by the whoosh of Volsian lasfire. A vox bank on an open channel was receiving sporadic transmissions from forts, bastions and outposts from across the garrison world. Beyond the stale stench of death and the fearful unfamiliarity of a world made stranger, Sheremetev only had the ear-bleeding insistence of the Vox to help him visualize the horror of the planet's predicament. His garrison world. His responsibility. The night of the meteor shower had taken everything else. The world turned. The blazing re-entries died away with the festivities. As night turned to day, Sheremetev ordered the Volsian Shadow Brigade back to force readiness and a full complement for the early morning watch. Only then did he hit his bunk. He was awoken only two hours later by the officer of the watch, Lieutenant Krusak. He informed his superior that an epidemic of blindness had broken out amongst the garrison guardsmen and the wider planetary population. Many had already lost their sight. For others, it was deteriorating fast. Send for the chief medical officer and the regimental astropath, Sheremetev had ordered. If the situation was as bad as it sounded, 
then they might need to send for assistance. Exley's overrun in the infirmary. We've sent for the astropath, Krusak had told him, but we can't find her. Shemeritev had sat on the side of his bunk. Gannibal and the Vulsions were murky silhouettes. Keep looking and turn on the lights, the Lord Marshal had said. They're on, sir, Grusak had told him. Sheremetev nodded to himself in the growing darkness. He tapped on his temple. Not in here, he had announced grimly. That had been two weeks ago, perhaps more. Arturus, Sheremetev croaked across the command post. Lord Marshal, the aged commissar replied finally. Still here? It was difficult to tell where he was. The floor, possibly. Sheremetev had found his way to a chair in front of a crackling rune bank. The raw hiss of the vox in one ear, and the meaningless chatter of a technomat servitor, repeating what Sheremetev could only think was an endless and growing list of emergency imperatives in lingua technus. Lieutenant. Nothing. Krosak. I think the lieutenant's dead, sir. Vanders. Yes, Lord Marshal. Sergeant. Check in. Sheremetev ordered. Yes, sir. The gruff voice of the Hive World Sergeant returned. Ordell. Zant. Nadina. Wozniak. The Lord Marshal heard all but Wozniak bleakly identify themselves from their positions on the blind perimeter. Thirst and hunger had hit them hard. Like the Lieutenant, Wozniak too had left them. Then, as the roll call was completed, Did you hear that? Sheremetev said, the distant boom of engines closing. It built to a passing thunder. Roaring thrusters taking craft down to the dusty plain to the east of the base, the landing zone that the garrison charitably called the Spaceport. A lander? Ganibor said weakly. The Adeptus Astatis? The sergeant suggested. Sheremetev wanted to give the Volsian some hope. Viper Legion, out of Aurelius, the Lord Marshal told them. Emperor be praised! Guardsman Nardina gasped. The Viper Legion occasionally honored Arx Phineas IV with visits as part of their own patrols and broader vigilance within the Garon Nebula. Sergeant, Sheremetev announced, the dry rasp of his voice assuming something of its usual confidence and determination. Protocols will be observed. Meet the Adeptus Astartes in the courtyard. Inform them that we are the victims of a rare astral phenomenon. Apprise them of the desperation of our situation. Take Zand. Go, son. Emperor's speed. Yes, Lord Marshal. As with Sheremetev, something of the old Volsian sergeant had returned. Sheremetev listened to Ordell pull aside the materials they had used to barricade the command post door and heard the two guardsmen stumble and pat their way along the access corridor. For the longest time, Sheremetev, the Commissar, and the remaining Volsians listened. They waited for salvation. It never came. The light flutter of hope in the Lord Marshal's stomach turned to lead, as he heard the sickening crash of a bolt gun out on the landing zone. Tumbling through the absolute darkness inside his head, his heart snatched in sickening realization. Sheremetev knew the sound of an execution round. It was closely followed by another. God, Emperor, no! was all the Lord Marshal could manage. Secure the perimeter! Commissar Gannibal ordered. What's happening? Guardsman Nardina bleated fearfully. It's not the Viper Legion, Gannibal told him. Nardina, Odell, get on the door! The wait was an eternity of screams. Not simple suffering. Not brutality for survival's sake. Not the pain and suffering that had followed the garrison world's descent into darkness. It wasn't fear for what was to come. 
It was the heart-plunging horror of the here and now. Menace. Dread. Fully realized. Torture. Terror. Death. Across the open Vox Channel, without the command center and within, guardsmen and the Imperial citizenry they were supposed to be protecting were at the mercy of an invasion force. Sheremetev had no choice but to wait and bear silent witness to the fearful ordeal while plate-clad monsters hunted his people with bolt gun and blade through the private darkness of their doom. When it arrived in the command center, the hydraulic inevitability of power-armored steps carrying the angels of death right up to their door, the thunderclap of bolt guns was almost a relief. Nardina died without even getting his finger to his trigger. Ordell's lasgun sent a wild whoosh at their attackers but to no avail. Within moments the coppery sting of their messy deaths filled the chamber. Silence. Step. Silence. Step. Sheremetev angled his head and listened for his end. When the voice came it was a booming everything, intimate yet everywhere, at one with the darkness in which the Lord Marshal was drowning. I have brought you the night, mortal. Sheremetev blinked his blindness and swallowed back his fear. My name is Demrid Sheremetev, Lord Marshal of the 1002nd Volscian Shadow Brigade. No, no, no. The voice chided, the words chill like the desert night. We don't deal in names. Neither yours, nor our own. We are the night. You are traitors. We deal in dread and the end that follows. The renegade angel told him. It is our calling. The storm, Sheremetev asked. It was yours? He had to know. A weapon of terror. The Chaos Space Marine told him. One of many at our disposal, Imperial Pig. Now, listen carefully. The darkness gave an order to one of its own. There was a scuffle. Sheremetev could hear Ganibal's feeble grunts of exertion against the Chaos Space Marines that held him. He reached out, but flinched as the Commissar's bolt pistol went off. The Lord Marshal heard his friend cry out, as an armoured gauntlet crushed the bone in his hand around the pistol, as well as the thunk of the pistol hitting the floor, where the owner of the silky voice kicked it away. That's better, the darkness said. Now we can talk. We have in our possession your soul-bound wretch of a regimental astro-telepath. Know that she is but a possession to us, without purpose, a piece of meat. I implore you, do not take away that purpose, for it is the only thing keeping her alive. What do you want? I want to answer your prayers, the darkness promised. I want to send a request for assistance to the Viper Legion on Aurelius. You want to lure the Emperor's angels here, so that you can murder them. Gannibal bawled at them, the aged Commissar still struggling against his captors. The witch will help us in order to save her psycho skin. The darkness told Sheremetev. But for Aurelius to take us seriously, we need your regimental authorization codes. The ones you are going to give me. Don't give this monster anything! Gannibal roared. The darkness gave another order. An instruction that was only made complete by the hideous screaming of the Commissar that followed. Do you hear that? The darkness put to Sheremetev, coming in close. He lacked foresight, and I'm taking his eyes. He wasn't going to need them. 
I'm here thinking about what else he might not need. And he will be but the first. I'll bring in your men, one by one, and take them apart before you. You'll hear their screams. You'll feel their blood spray against your face. Sheremetev was shaking his head. I beg you, don't do this. No, I beg you, do not take the selfish path. I can't give you. You can. The darkness insisted. You can, and you will, and here is why. Nobody's coming to help you, to save you, to avenge you. My vessel is positioned to destroy any vessel attempting to leave or enter the system. After deploying the atmospherics, you took for a pretty storm. We sat in deep orbit for days just to listen to your tiny garrison world tear itself apart. The screams. The merciless degeneration of order into chaos, robbery, and murder. Before we even set foot on this planet, we savored it all. Do not doubt our commitment to your suffering. Do this, and I promise you my mercy. Timrid? No! Gannibal moaned. You have to. The darkness told him. So close the words seemed to proceed from his own broken mind. I have to. Sheremetev finally agreed. The astro-telepathic authorization code. Four, two, seven, the Lord Marshal told him miserably. Psi, Sigma, Epsilon, Delta. The voice was suddenly distant once more. The Chaos Space Marine in Congress with his dark brethren. Ensure that she tells them that this miserable world belongs to the Night Lords. The darkness seethed. And exaggerate reports of our number. I want the Viper Legion to send everything they have. Then, to another renegade angel. Have the Tenebrius hold low orbit, and stand by to receive our Thunderhawks. Then, set a course for Aurelius. Yes, my lord. For Shemeritev, there were no words. We bring the night. The darkness told him. We brought the night to your wretched world. And while the Viper Legion mobilizes their companies, rushing to the aid of your corpses, we will bring the terror of the night to the Angel's home world. Shiremetev heard Gannibal moan. Mercy! The Night Lord chuckled darkly. Your people shall die of thirst. The darkness told him. Of starvation. Of each other. You, however, who have been such a use to our cause. How could I not grant you an angel's mercy? Shiremetev heard the clunk of the Night Lord's bolt pistol priming. What do you think I am? A monster? End of Night by Ben Counter For those who say there is no beauty left in the galaxy, said Memnagon. Let them look upon this. Beyond the precipice stretched a bewildering expanse of madness. The ground was of black glass, shattered into a labyrinth of sheer-sided chasms into which poured corrosive waterfalls, flowing to toxic underground oceans. Steam billowed from enormous machines breaching the surface, cogs and pistons heaving up black glass islands in time with the beating of this world's steam-powered heart. The sky was seething, the color of rust. Weak-minded maniacs crowded by the greater machinery, in the shadow of spinning flywheels and coils of brazen spring. 
They were drawn there by nightmares and visions, mutineers and stowaways. They leapt into the workings, lubricating the workings with their blood in frenzied offerings to the Lord who sent them their calling. The sprays of steam were tinted pink with their vaporized bodies. Memnagon of the Night Lords turned to see his warband following him up the slope of the glass mountains. He had led them through the warp storm, across worlds as mad or even more mad than this, always seeking the greatest triumphs to prove their worth to the powers of the warp. Brothers, he said, this is the cradle of brass. Here, Prince Catul reigns, and here he will be destroyed. Then let the view be sufficiently admired, said Hellcast, whose humor was grim even on the eve of triumph. There is a lord of demons to kill. Hellcast was one of the oldest of the dozen night lords in Memnagon's warband. The dark blue of his armor was almost lost in the barnacle-like growths that flourished in the warp miniature creatures that fed off his anger and hate. I dreamt of this, said the dry, tattered voice of Fulcrum, whose armor was covered in scraps of parchment that constantly smoldered with the power of the prayers he had written on them. That all falls like a continent sinking into an ocean, in fire and blood, I have seen it. I brought you here because I sought out the greatest prize said Memnagon. I spilt my own blood to read from the oracles. They spoke of a demon lord in a body of brass and steel. We seek to pit ourselves against the greatest challenges the warp can put before us, my brothers. And this one, as all before them, we shall crush. Once, said Druthix, we knelt before a golden throne. We obeyed. We defied the men we were. Druthix was a gladiator, a student of bloodshed armed with a pair of ancient lightning claws that only one who had studied them for centuries could wield. But we cast off those chains. We chose freedom. And the greatest freedom is to face the will of the warp itself and defeat it. Thus is the glory of chaos. Freedom and glory. Freedom and glory, yelled the Night Lords as one, holding chainswords and bolt guns high in salute. The salute was to Chaos, and to Memnagon. Our blades together are the equal of Cthul, said Memnagon. And now all the warp shall learn it. The hate had almost burned Memnagon up from the inside. It had been ignited by his legion's banishment from the fold of mankind from being cast aside by an emperor to whom the Night Lords had dedicated themselves. Or was it the Night Lords who turned from the emperor first? The memories were so fractured by hate that the details had been lost. But the hate had not taken him. He had found a group of Night Lords wandering the galaxy seeking to quench the same fires inside them. Together they learned their purpose. Victory cooled the fires down and made them bearable. Victory over the greatest enemies they could find. Only then could a man feel like he meant anything against the infinite cruelty of the galaxy. Only then could he be worthy of the glory of the warp. In the moment of victory and never any time else, a man could be truly free. It was the anticipation of that moment that burned through Memnagon's body as he ran up the glass slope towards the throne of Prince Cthul. The vast machinery of the planet's heart broke through in a mass of brazen entrails. Roaring pistons hammered into the ground, hurling gales of razored slivers that clattered against Memnagon's armor. A huge throne of bronze and steel rose lopsidedly from the peak of the rise, upon which sat a hulking draconic creature. Like the world beneath its feet, it was a horror in clockwork. The fires of the demon within burning between plates of glowing hot armor. Its head was long and fanged, its eyes an array of gold-tinted lenses embedded in an iron skull wreathed in steam. You do not 
not seek an audience, growled a voice of grinding steel. For those who seek one stand before me, raving and tattered, driven here by their dreams, and you do not seek to pledge your devotion, for you do not kneel in obedience and terror. So this one surmises you have come to depose him, and sit upon his throne. Memnagon's hatred was too strong to express. He had tried. In prayers hurled into the warp and diatribe screamed into the faces of beaten enemies. But he had learned that only victory would calm it down. He drew his power mace, the blood on it smouldering in its power field. The blood never dried, an eternal reminder of every victory. I am Memnicon of the Night Lords, he said, fighting to keep his voice level. And these are the brothers of my warband, wanderers through the warp. We take the heads of only the worthiest of foes. Be honored, Prince Catul, in death. Catul lurched up from his throne, four limbs unfolding into blades of burning steel. An articulated tail slithered across the ground as he thudded onto the glass slope, rearing up over Memnagon with eye lenses narrowing. Then let another skull be cast upon the pirates! Catul growled and lunged at Memnagon. A great raking claw shattered the ground beneath Memnagon, a half second after he rolled out of the way. Catul roared in anger, steam spraying from every joint of his mechanical body. There is not but one Night Lord here to depose you, cried out Memnagon. He drew his bolt pistol and shot out one of the Demon Prince's eyes, yellow steam spurting from the ruined socket. You face the blades of my brothers, and as one, we will bring you down. Memnagon had traveled the galaxy, real space and warp, for centuries with his warband. Those early days were corroded in his memory, but the more recent years were a parade of victories, every one of his brothers working in concert to defeat foes none could take on alone. He knew their strengths, weaknesses, and the actions they would take in the next few seconds, the chains of cause and effect that each one would spark, all leading to victory as inevitable as the warp itself. First, a burst of bolt of fire would blind the Demon Prince, then the Night Lords would charge him with chainswords and power maces, shattering the demon's joints so it collapsed to the ground. There they would dismember it, piece by piece, until it was spread out across the expanse of broken glass. Memnagon hammered fire up into the demon's face, anticipating the volley of shots that would burst its remaining eyes. There was no gunfire from behind. No night lords charged in beside him. Memnagon glanced back, risking a split second with his eyes off his enemy. At the base of the slope the warband stood, watching. None of them had drawn a weapon. None of them moved to help their leader. The shock of the sight was almost as cold and painful as the blade that lanced through his back and out through the side of his abdomen. Almost, but not quite. Memnagon grabbed the blade and snapped it off, giving him room to slide himself off it even as the pain ran through him. He shut the pain off, ordering that weak, human part of his brain to fall silent. Memnagon turned, one leg buckling weakly under him. He was on one knee when Catul's hand came down again, this time the blades of his claw cutting down through both of Memnagon's shoulders, carving down to his waist, through lung and intestine. Memnagon flopped backwards, and as the color drained out of his vision, he could see the warband still lined up below, unmoving. They did not flinch or draw a single blade as Prince Catul peeled Memnagon apart and cast the gory chunks of his remains across the shattered glass. There was nothing left on this world for them. Their spacecraft, 
a corroded and misshapen gunship inhabited by a surly enslaved demon, squatted like a black metal toad in the obsidian valley where they had landed. The light of the pyre flickered against its pitted hull, the pyre on which what little remained of Memnagon was burned. He had to die, said Fulcrum as he stood over the fire. Chaos is freedom. In pure freedom no one man can rule over another. By proclaiming himself above us, Memnigon violated the freedom that is chaos. We will not turn down such a path again. The warp has had its way. Do you not remember? Snarled Hellcast. We thought that before, with Lord Korst and Vixel Kren before him. They fought the hardest and won the most, and so they came to lead us. And then we abandoned them to their deaths, because Chaos will not have one of us lorded over the others. He looked around him, at the other Night Lords of the Warband who stood silent in the wake of his words. None of you remember. The Warp corrodes our minds, it is true. I cannot remember who I was before I took on these colors. But surely you can remember the deaths of those who went before Memnagon. Be silent, Hellcast. Damn your guts. It was Druthix who had spoken. This is our quest. We defeat the weakness within as well as the enemies without. Memnagon died. We all understand why. Thus we throw off the weakness of his law and come closer to chaos. But we will come no closer, replied Hellcast. It will happen again. Maybe it will be me. Maybe you, Truthix. Maybe even this pallid youth here. Hellcast jabbed a finger at Fulcrum, the youngest appearing of the warband. But one of us will come to lead the rest again. He will believe he is different, that the rest of us will forgive him his law and let him live when the victories come rolling in. But he will be wrong, and we will abandon him, and he will die. How many times has it happened? Ten? A hundred? A thousand? Then break the cycle, said Fulcrum. His eyes were wide, as if he was in the grip of one of his visions, when the landscape of the warp unraveled before his mind's eye, and he could read the future from its contours. Throw yourself on the fire! Or take that bolt pistol and put a round through your skull. If that is, you think that it will grant you an escape? Hellcast looked down at the pyre, which was burning low, leaving only a few chunks of charred bone. Did we once think we could rise above chaos? He said darkly. And seek to impress its gods with our triumphs? Are we being punished for our arrogance? Is that why we are here? The other Night Lords were already embarking onto their ship. Perhaps they had not even heard him. With a final glance at the remains of the fire, Hellcast joined them. The ship rose from the Obsidian Valley, breaching the clouds to continue its flight through a night that would never end.